Hello?
Okay, um, hello everyone. It seems I can't share my camera, but you should at least be able to see the slides. Uh, sincere apologies for the delay. I don't know why the event uh, sharing didn't work, but please let me know when you want me to start. And also please use the chat or something to give a heads up if you can hear me, yes or no. So again, as a check, if you can hear me, please just uh, type a message in the chat such that I know it is working. Okay, I see we have a few people signed up. Uh, can anyone just give a confirmation in the chat or anyone? Uh, uh, yeah, so just type a message in the chat if you can hear me. So once more, I think we're ready to start, but I just would like to have a quick confirmation if uh, people can hear me. So if you can hear me, please just type a yes or no in the, uh, or just a yes in the chat message, please. Right, so should I just start? I believe everyone should be able to see my screen at least to see the slides. Unfortunately, my webcam doesn't work for some reason, but the audio and the screen should work.
Okay, I'm still not sure if people can hear me. So if someone could confirm in the chat, that would be much appreciated. All right, once more, can uh, can someone hear me? Is the audio okay? If so, please let me know in the chat. So once more, I'm happy to start, but I'm not sure if people can hear me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'll just get started. Uh, again, sincere apologies for the delay. I don't know why the other option didn't work, uh, but let me just get started on the uh, presentation. Thanks again for your patience and thanks for joining. So my name is Kevin Bistom, and I would like to share this tonight, finally, better late than never with you a talk about fractured reservoir analysis. And this talk is about the good, the bad, and the ugly of what we can do in fractured reservoir analysis. So I was hoping to use my webcam, but also for that some reason that doesn't work either. So uh, you'll just have to do with this picture of me. A brief introduction. So my name is Kevin. I have a PhD in geomechanics and a master's in petroleum engineering. And I've, uh, during that time, worked a lot on fractured reservoirs, particularly carbonate reservoirs, but also a little bit on shale reservoirs. And that's what I'll be talking about uh, in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat and then we can discuss them afterwards. So in my work on fractured reservoirs, I've mostly been working on the integration of outcrop and subsurface data. And that's also a topic that I'll discuss touch upon in this uh, presentation. And uh, currently I work at uh, with Shell in Amsterdam and the Netherlands, where I'm a geomechanicist in the CO2 storage and containment team, uh, where we do work on uh, research to ensure that we can safely store CO2 in the subsurface, but we also work on uh, assuring we have safe water flooding operations and these kind of things that so we don't break the cap rock during these operations. And that's also very much related to uh, fracturing. So this talk is about fractured reservoirs and analyzing fractured reservoirs or building models of fractured reservoirs is even more challenging uh, than conventional reservoir modeling. And the reason for that is that fractures uh, control fluid flow, but these fractures are typically not visible on seismic because the resolution is too low to see these fractures that are typically several meters long or wide. We can see the fractures with wells. So we have an example here. Let me see if I can use the, um, the pointer. I hope you can see that as well. So we have core data and in the cores, we can see the fractures, but wells are only basically 1D data because in a volume of several by several kilometers of a reservoir, we may only have a few wells. So we need to find other ways to build a 3D model of our fractured reservoir. 
And for that, we strongly depend on conceptual models and outcrop studies. And as the title suggests here, there are good, bad, and there are ugly ways to do this as well. And I'll use an example of the Vaca Muerta shields in Argentina to, uh, to illustrate this. But first, in a bit more detail, what do I mean with bad in terms of uh, quantitative modeling? Now, for a long time, we've been using geological concepts to build our models. And this already goes back many centuries ago when the first geologists came around. We were using uh, outcrops to understand how rocks were being formed and how rocks were impacting, uh, uh, or how different processes were impacting rocks. And this we did basically by going out with a hammer and studying those rocks. Now that was fine at that time, but now in a time where we're building high-tech reservoir models with uh, very much quantitative data, we also need to have more quantitative data coming from outcrops if we want to make use of them in our uh, reservoir models. And unfortunately, we're not doing that too much. So we're still going out in the field and we're still measuring fractures by hand and we're using scan lines and these kind of things to measure the opening of fractures to understand what could be fracture porosity permeability. But in the end, we need to go to a reservoir model uh, where we really have a 3D quantitative representation of these fractures and how they impact permeability. So we need to do a better way of using this data from outcrops. Now, one way to do this is to use yeah, there we go, is to use more quantitative models. And uh, by that, I mean 3D outcrop models or 3D subsurface models constrained with outcrop data, where we really use uh, large data sets. So hundreds or thousands of fractures that were accurately mapped. And we can use different techniques for that. For example, laser scanning. So here's a device that scans the entire outcrop and then makes a very high resolution picture from that. Then we can extract the fractures from that and use that in our models. And similarly, we can also use drones. So here's an example of a drone. And uh, these drones can, of course, also be used to, uh, to create 3D models. Just... Yes. Uh, let me just check one thing here. I'm not sure the slides are skipping properly. Um... One moment. Ah, there we do the camera actually. Sorry, let me just make sure I'm sharing the, your entire screen. All right, excellent. Yes. So it should definitely work now. Sorry about that. So we had the good, that was three quantitative out models, but now let's talk about the ugly. Because we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. What I mean by ugly is that we then use these very nice 3D data sets. And um, can we go to pointer again? So we use these very nice 3D data sets, but then we only extract limited information from that and put it in our conventional workflow. So the conventional workflow is that we have core data, that we have, for example, well test data, we have some seismic, but then to properly build our fractures reservoir model, we need some other distributions, for example, fracture size, and those we need to get from uh, outcrops. But as I said here, what we then do, what is a shame, is that we have these very nice 3D outcrop models and then we only take a limited amount of data from that to come up with reservoir permeability. And we're throwing out a lot of other data from these high resolution outcrop models that are actually very useful as well and very important if we want to make our models. So the key message that I would like to explain here is that there are different ways to build fractured reservoir models. Uh, the bad way would be to use only very little data, so a few statistics or a few numbers from outcrops that don't really capture the full distributions that we need. Then the alternative way, the good way, let's go to the good way, is to use high resolution, large models with thousands of fractures that we can then use to better understand what is controlling flow through those fractures and how can we use that information to build better reservoir models. And the ugly way is to spend a lot of effort on creating these very high resolution models, but then to only extract a little bit of 1D data to fill in the gaps of our fractured reservoir models. And I'll give an example here where we're dealing with a subsurface reservoir where we were doing uh, basically the ugly, and then we sh changed to doing the good, and that helped us to better understand the reservoir. Now let me quickly skip these two slides and get to the actual example. 
So what I'll be talking about here is um, uh, hydraulic fracturing, the Vaca Marta formation in Argentina. So this is an unconventional play. These are shales that are both naturally fractured and then also being hydraulically fractured. Now these natural fractures uh, alone are not enough to create economically productive wells. So we need to frack these wells to generate a high permeability. But in this fracking operation, we can make use of the natural fractures to further increase the permeability. So for that, the challenge here was that we need to understand first, what do these natural fractures look like and what kind of contribution can they have on flow? And then we can use that information to optimize the hydraulic fracturing operations. Now, this was a small project that I did uh, one or two years ago uh, with Total. And uh, the things that I uh, present here are also published. Um, so that's uh, how we can talk about these things. Now, so what I said already here, the challenge was that we have to make optimal use of natural fractures to optimize fluid flow. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of the Vagamata formation. Uh, so it's a subsurface formation, of course, but in a different part of the basin, we also see it outcropping. Uh, and here's one example, and you see clearly that there are a lot of natural fractures. So you see these orthogonal fracture patterns, um, and these are the natural fractures that I was talking about that may help us to get an even higher permeability when we do the fracking operations. Now, there are also different ways to do fracking. And uh, again, you can talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And of course, you're probably familiar with how fracking is mostly done in the US, which is the country where most of the fracking is actually being done. And if you look at this picture on here on the right, I would say that this is the ugly way of doing fracking. Uh, because basically there's not a lot of thought put into it, uh, to be brutally honest, it's just drilling a lot of wells, fracking them and trying to uh, get the most out of them. Now, of course, you can't do this everywhere, um, especially in other regions in the world. You have to be more careful about well planning and basically you have to drill less wells and still get production out. And that is also the challenge here in Argentina. Now, when I came to this project, there was already some work being done. And actually what they had already done was to create a discrete fracture network for the Vaca Marta formation, so for their reservoirs, based on partially well data and also partially outcrop data. And uh, so they had a pilot project where they drilled several horizontal wells and fracked them and looked also at what do the natural fractures look like. So they used formation, borehole images and these kind of things. And then also used additional information from outcrops to come up with a fracture network model. Now the problem here was that although this fracture network model was based on data from the subsurface and outcrops, it highly overestimated the connectivity and permeability. As a matter of fact, based on this fracture network model, you wouldn't even have to frack because based on the natural fractures alone, the model predicted that there would be more than 100 millidarcy permeability, whereas in reality, there was more like 0.1 millidarcy at the most. Uh, so this model was highly overestimating connectivity and permeability. So we needed to come up with different models. And that was the approach that we then followed was more data driven. And one limitation here was that we didn't have production data yet. So this was a pilot project where they haven't really, they only fracked two or three wells and only just to see, uh, to do some well tests, but not to actually produce from them yet. Uh, so we didn't really have production data, but we did have other data. And most notably, there was micro seismic. So during fracking, they were measuring micro seismic events. So here you see a cross section of the seismic, you see the wells, and you see here point clouds that represent the micro seismic. And here you see similarly, you see a top view of one of these horizontal wells, and you also see the micro seismic events around that. So that was one data source. And the other data source, what they did was uh, interference tests. So they were doing fracking in one well and then looking at changes in pressure or permeability in the other well. And that information was what we then used to constrain our models. And we also knew in terms of fracture permeability that uh, the before fracking that there was a natural fracture network but it was not contributing to flow and during fracking and after fracking we saw a significant improvement in fluid flow of course and uh, so we do have some permeability data there that we can use to constrain our models 
So the approach that we followed here, because there was not so much production data, but there was mechanical data, so geomechanical data in terms of uh, the, the pressure in the wells and the micro seismic, is that we could do sort of geomechanical history matching, making use of the subsurface data, but also the outcrop data to come up with a improved model of the natural fractures that better captured all the data. Now, let me give you, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this area, so let me give a little bit of an introduction. So the Vacamarta Formation is in the Nequen Basin in the west of Argentina, close to the border between Chile and Argentina. And uh, the area that I'm focusing on here is, uh, or did, yeah, the acreage that I'm focusing on here is located here in this red box. And uh, here we are in the Vacamerta Formation, which is divided into two zones. Uh, so there's a zone with low TOC, so organic content and high TOC, and the high TOC zone has more than 10%, uh, I believe, yes. So there's a very high potential here in terms of recoverable volumes, because we're talking about a very thick formation with a high organic content, uh, so a high potential volume. And the porosity is actually pretty high, but it's all very much scattered uh, around the pores. So in terms of, there's a high porosity, but permeability is actually in the order of nano Darcy. So without any fracking, there's no flow. And if we frack, we have an effective permeability after fracking of around 15 milli Darcy. What is furthermore interesting here is that the best practices that we learned from these shills in the US do not very much apply here. And that is mostly because these shills in the Vacamerta formation are actually more um, a limestone rich or carbonate shills. So they're not so ductile as the shills in the US, but they're a little bit more in between a carbonate and a shill in some areas. So because of that, we don't really know what is the ideal frac size and what is the stimulated rock volume when we do the fracking. And of course, because fracking operations are very much expensive, this is what we want to optimize before we actually start doing fracking on a very large scale. So as I said, there's been a pilot project and that's indicated here. So this is a map view from Google Earth and there were several horizontal wells drilled from one well pad uh, or, or several nearby well pads. And uh, a few of those wells were fracked, micro seismic was measured, and that's a data set that we can use to constrain our models in combination with some outcrop data. And the main thing, or the, the main conclusion that was derived from these uh, initial pilot tests is that there was quite some heterogeneity, and that is not expected, because usually with shields, we hope that the material is fairly homogeneous. But uh, we, we saw different things. So first of all, this is again a cross section through the seismic. You see this horizontal well that was fracked and nearby there was a vertical well. Uh, and of course the vertical scale here is highly exaggerated. Uh, I think five times. So the horizontal well was fracked and the vertical well was used as a monitoring well. And here you see the points here. These are micro seismic events that were measured during or observed during the fracking. And we see here uh, the, the first stage of fracking created micro seismic events going up uh, several uh, 200 meters. Uh, so very high vertical connectivity, whereas the second fracking event, which had the same amount of fluids, the same pressures, etc., was more confined vertically. So you see fewer micro seismic events and you almost see no micro seismic events here. So that is already an indication that there's some heterogeneity because our frac here is less effective than our frac here. Now also when we look at a map view, we see a similar kind of view. So this is a top view of a horizontal well that is being fracked. Another horizontal well uh, that is not being, well, uh, that's not relevant here and a vertical well. And we're fracking in this horizontal well. You have different stages and these are the micro seismic events and the different colors correspond to different micro seismic events. Uh, uh, sorry, the different colors correspond to different fracking stages. So frac one, frac two, frac three, etc. During fracking, we were then also measuring interference, so any kind of pressure interference in the two wells next to this. And the distance of both the horizontal well and the vertical well is only 400 meters with respect to the well that's being fracked. Now, interestingly enough, during fracking, we did see interference in this vertical well, but we saw no interference in this horizontal well at all. 
So that also indicates that there's some kind of heterogeneity in between these wells. The question is, what is that heterogeneity? Now, as I said already, we're dealing with fairly homogeneous shields. So actually, in terms of lithology, we don't expect any differences. It mainly seems to be the fracturing. So fortunately, in addition to outcrop data, we also have oral image logs that have yielded um, uh, a whole data set of interpreted fractures, their orientation, their density, um, and that we can use for our models as well. And this is then some of the geomechanical data that I talked about earlier that we can use for calibration. On the left-hand side, we have the uh, we have all kinds of geomechanical logs that help us to understand the vertical uh, lithology or the mechanical stratigraphy, and that can allow us to understand whether certain formations are more fractured than other formations. So here we have the Young's models, which is representative of formation strength as a function of depth, and that we can try to correlate to fracture intensity from the logs that I showed in the previous slide for our models. And similarly, we have measurements of stress. So we have uh, calculated and measured uh, vertical stresses, horizontal stresses, spore pressures here in purple. And all this data we can again also use to uh, do our gene chemical history measurement. And we have the pressure interference data. So here we were fracking one well. Uh, so over time, you see the different frac stages here, the vertical lines. Each vertical line is a frac stage. And then we see the pressure in the monitoring well. And you see that after three or uh, with the fourth stage, we see a clear pressure increase. So this stage created a pathway between the fracture well and the monitoring well. All right, so this information we then used to generate a new fracture network of the natural fractures. So we're not looking at the induced fractures or hydraulic fractures, we're only looking at the existing natural fracture network. And then based on our fracture network model, we can identify what are the best intervals to do the fracking to have the biggest increase in permeability. And for that, we created a different type. Of, we, we created geomechanical models where we can look at uh, where we can basically recreate the fracking pilots and see what happens with the pressure in the reservoir. So here we have a discrete fracture network model that was based on the well data and the outcrop data. And uh, from that, we generated the geomechanical model. So we made a 2D slice through this. So this is the top view. You see the two horizontal wells. Those are the red lines. And you see the vertical well that is the star symbol. And uh, then based on the effective, so we calculated an effective permeability of those fractures. And then we created geomechanical models. So here we have the stresses acting on the boundaries that we obtained from the well data. We have the mechanical rock properties that we obtained from the well data. And then we have the frac setups. So we know where each frac was taking place, what the fracking pressure was. And then we look at what is then the modeled pressure distribution and after how many fracks do we see, for example, pressure interference in the other well. So this is basically just geomechanical history matching where we have models that capture flow and pressure, uh, including also the geomechanical, the, the, the regional stresses and also the natural fracture permeability. Now, the big question is then, of course, what is the natural fracture permeability? And as a matter of fact, the natural fracture permeability is sort of a, a history matching parameter that we can adjust uh, to find the pressure distribution that matches the observations. And this way we can back calculate what is the natural fracture permeability. And then we can come up with a better estimate compared to the estimate from the original model, which was 100 minute RC, which was far too high. So to get some constraints on the natural fracture permeability, uh, we used a model. And uh, this model was based on some fin section analysis. So we had a rough idea of the fracture aperture. And we saw that fracture aperture uh, in the fin sections of the cores was maybe only 0.1 millimeter, so fairly small. And then we used a model that calculates the aperture distribution, which you see here between 0 millimeters and 0 0.12 millimeters, so very small apertures. Uh, based on the boundary stress conditions. So as I said, based on the log data, we know the regional stress state, we know the overburner stress, the, the boundary stresses. And then we use an empirical relation between those stresses and the initial fracture aperture to calculate the fracture aperture of the natural fracture network. 
and then also the effective permeability of the natural friction network. And then the calculations that we come up with, so the revised calculations, give us a permeability that is highly anisotropic, uh, because we see based on, on seismic and log data that we have more fractures in the east-west direction compared to the north-south direction. So permeability in the east-west direction is a lot higher than the north-south direction. And we also have uh, corridors and areas outside of corridors. So we have some zones that have a very high fracture density. So here's one that you can see a little bit, and here's another one. And these have a higher effective permeability than uh, the, the fractures outside of those zones. Now, these permeabilities are still, um, oh yeah, so I have to emphasize that these permeabilities are the reactivated fracture permeability. So it's not just based on the regional stress, but it's also based on the uh, fracking pressure. So with fracking, we increase the pore pressure in the rock. And with this increased pore pressure in the rock, we also get the increase in permeability. So this is the fracked fracture permeability. And that's why it's, uh, it's up to 40 millidarsi in the corridors, uh, which is closer to what we uh, uh, measured from the well tests, which indicated roughly 50 millidarsi permeability. Now, with this information, we can then make our geomechanical history matching models. So for this, uh, we use the finite element simulation tool, uh, which is called Abacus, where you can make a, a, a gridded model. Uh, so you have a, a 2D model in this case, again, a map view of your reservoir, where we can uh, bring in the wells. We have the different frac stages. And then as a function of time, we can start injecting fluids. So we can start injecting the fracking fluids at different points uh, in the well, representing the different fracks for a number of hours. And then we can see how the in situ pressure, which is uh, the in situ pore pressure is 52 megapascal, how that increases with time. And then we can see, um, based on the interference and micro seismic, if our model is uh, correct. So we use here the injection times and pressures. We use the reactivated permeability that comes out of the model that I showed in the previous slide. We use the reservoir pressure, and then we model what the injection distribution looks like. And once we've history matched this, and once we have the correct permeability, then we can also start playing around with the different settings of the fracking. So we can move the wells, and we can look at different injection pressures and come up with the optimal strategy. Now, first, we do the history matching part. So here, um, and let's focus on the picture on the right-hand side, we have uh recreated the fracking in uh, the one well so we have two wells that are fracked but here we focus only on the one well and um what is important is that we the the fracture corridors that we observed are really important to get a correct history match uh, so you see here in gray are several extrapolated corridors so as i said we saw very high fracture density zones in the two wells and those we then extrapolated and those high permeability zones they are really uh, it, it is likely to be there based on the pressure distribution so again what this model shows you is the two wells in a map view and then we start fracking and you see pressure increases around this well corresponding to the fracks and these extrapolate uh, to a large zone so this blue line here is the reservoir pressure so the original reservoir pressure of 52 megapascal and close to the well where we're fracking, it increases with 8 megapascal to 60 megapascal. Um, and then you also see that along the fracture corridors, you get a, a, a faster increase or a wider spread in your pore pressure increase. And that is also shown in an image here. So here again, we're fracking one well. And you see the different stages. So you start here in the south and we move upward. And now we start fracking the second well here as well. And with each frac, you see that the pressure in the reservoir increases and the area in which the pressure increases uh, is also extending. So you see that after fracking the two wells, we have a large zone uh, that is completely fracked. And similarly, so let me see if I can uh, start that again. Um, So I go back and that starts again. So you see again the distribution. And similarly, we also see, uh, we look at the pressure. So now we look at the pressure in between the two wells, so somewhere here in the reservoir, and then we look at it over time. 
Um, so on the horizontal axis, you have time, and on the vertical axis, you have the pressure, which starts at 52 megapascal, which is the reservoir pressure. And then with each frac stage, so every line here is a frac stage, you see an increase in the pressure up to a certain point where we no longer see an increase in pressure, in absolute pressure, but we do see further extension of the pressure. Now, this, these kind of models, we can then compare with the data that we have. So you may remember earlier on, I showed that we have uh, the micro seismic and the pressure interference. So we know for this well, which we fract into two, 10 stages or actually nine stages, one field. So we have the nine stages and we saw that after four stages, we started seeing pressure interference in the vertical well that was close to that. And that's this profile again. So you have the fourth stage, which was this stage here. And you see the pressure interference here. So we know that two, those two wells were in communication. Uh, but we also know that there was another horizontal well, it's very close by, that didn't see any pressure interference. So again, no interference. And this, we believe, based on these models that I was just showing you, uh, we believe that this is related to the fracture corridors. So we did see in this well number B, uh, well B, we saw three fracture corridors. Uh, no, sorry, two fracture corridors. There was one observed here, and there was one observed here in the well. And again, that, you see that based on the horizontal well trajectory, you see an increase in density. Uh, the box should be a bit more to the right, but here you see an increase in fracture density indicative of one of these fracture corridors. Now also in well C, we also saw two fracture corridors. And well A was also likely close to a corridor. Now, the big question is, of course, because we can only see those corridors in the wells, we do not know whether these corridors are actually communicating in between the different wells. And our base assumption was that they would be continuing from one well to another, but the pressure interference, or more likely the lack of pressure interference, actually indicates that uh, it's more likely that the corridors in this well are very small and not connecting to other wells, whereas the corridor here is very large and is connecting these two wells. And that's why you get pressure interference in one well and no pressure interference in the other wells. So we've tested this with the models. And indeed, if you stop the corridors here, then um, uh, the, the pressure distribution is very uh, uh, limited here. Whereas if you still have a permeability pathway here, you do get the pressure interference here. So of course you need more well data or you need maybe to drill well in between here to validate this further, uh, but the models at least explain why you get interference in one well and not in the other well. Now, once you've done this sort of history matching, you can then also start to look at optimizing your fracture, uh, your hydraulic fracturing strategy. So for example, we can look at the spacing between wells. And in the pilot project, we used 400 meters horizontal spacing in between wells. And then you see here in the picture on the left hand side, you see the, um, the, the, the pressure distribution after fracking. So you see this is the in situ reservoir pressure. And in this entire area within those lines, we have increased the pressure thanks to fracking. And you also see that the maximum pressure is around 56 megapascal uh, measured here in this point in between the wells. So you see here, uh, during the fracking of the two wells, you see the increase in pressure up to 56 megapascal. Now, if we then double the well spacing to roughly 800 meters instead of 400 meters, then you see that the pressure increase, the maximum pressure increase is still close to what it was for the 400 meter spacing. But the area in which we've increased the pressure, so in which we have reactivated natural fractures as well, is larger compared to this one. And that's what you want. You don't only want to increase pressure, but you want to increase pressure in the largest volume possible. So the largest simulated rock volume. And that's also shown here. So here again, you see the injection pressure as a function of time. So you do see that the absolute pressure is a little bit lower than what it was if you have the wells closer by. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you do have a larger stimulated rock volume and that's in the end what you want. And similarly, you can also see that in the 400 meter case, you see flattening off of the curve, whereas here the injection pressure is still increasing. So what you could do here is actually uh, prolong the fracking time in the 800 meter well to come up to a similar pressure increase as what you had for 400 meter well. So here there's a potential for larger well spacing in combination with longer injection times. 
Now, this is a bit of a complicated uh, uh, picture, but again, it shows a, a range of um, uh, parameters that you can change in the fracking, and you can see the different impacts. So on the left-hand side, you see the two wells that we did these simulations on. So you have well number B and well number C. So these are our original two wells. And what you see around here, these contour lines indicate the stimulated rock volume, so the extent of the stimulated rock volume for different fracking policies. So to take one example, um, in the default case, we were doing um, uh, two fracks per stage for uh, fairly long injection times. And if you do only one frac, you see immediately that your stimulated rock volume will become a lot smaller. So this line is for two hour fracks, uh, for two fracks per stage, and this is for one frac per stage, and then of course your stimulated rock volume decreases. Um, and on the other hand, if you increase the spacing between wells, then you get a very large stimulated rock volume because there's just more area you're stimulating. So with these simulations, you can do different sensitivity studies and then look at what is the maximum pressure increase at any given location, which is the plot here on the left-hand side, and what is the extent of the stimulated rock volume, which is the plot on the right-hand side. And this way, you can then really start optimizing your fracking strategy. Now, the last part that I want to talk about is the vertical connectivity. So one thing that I didn't talk about earlier, or I didn't explain, is why did we see the difference in vertical connectivity in the different fracking stages. So just to refresh your memory, we had a horizontal well here that was being fracked. And here you see the microseismic events, and you see that for one frac, there's microseismic events in an area of, of 200 meters vertically, whereas in the other, the microseismic events are much more limited. And this indicates that your frac is a lot less effective here as well. And that is likely related to the rock properties of the Faka Marta formation. So as I said, this is not a conventional shield because there's a lot of calcite in there. And um, there's also a lot of thick calcite layers in there. So these are called beef features. And uh, these are thick calcite veins, so they can be up to several centimeters thick. And these may actually impact the vertical connectivity of the rock. And in addition, uh, there are also uh, ash beds so volcanic eruptions have created a centimeter thick layer of um, very fine grained ash in the rock and that miles that also creates um, heterogeneities in the rock. So the question is, can these features, so these beefs and these shield layers, can they stop the vertical fracture growth? So can it be that there may be some beef features over here that stop the vertical fracture growth? Now, again, to investigate this, we can use these geomechanical fluid flow models. And now, instead of map view, we're now looking at a cross section. So we have here a vertical well that is being fracked, and then we have a um, uh, 20 centimeter, so they can really be thick layers, a 20 centimeter thick layer of these calcite beefs in there. And then we can start injecting just below this point, and we see what happens with the injected fluids. So we have our stresses, we have our vertical stress, uh, we have a model that's 30 meters thick. Uh, so this cross section here is the same as this. So this is a cross section where we have the vertical stress here. Uh, it's 30 meters thick. And then we have this injection point over here. And in this case, if we just have a homogeneous rock, so if you have a homogeneous shale without any uh, calcite beds, then what you would expect is just a radial flow pattern from the injection point out into the rock. Now here's then an example where we have such a beef layer. So this is again the result of a mechanical uh, model. We're injecting fluid in this point and we see how the fluid uh, dissipates with time. So the fracking fluid. So here we have the beef layer and we do see that fluids can still propagate through this layer. So we can still see some pressure here, some pressure increase here but it's a lot smaller overall than here because we need a lot of energy. So a lot of fracking energy is actually being wasted by trying to break through this beef layer. And that's why the vertical connectivity is a lot more limited in this simulation. So this is an indication that these beef features may actually form uh, vertical limits to the fracking. So it's very important to look for those features in the well logs, so in the oral images and in the core data to really map where they are and to avoid fracking close to them. Um, on the other hand, there is one mechanism that 
uh, may play a role here. So it may be that the vertical connectivity is limited, but the horizontal connectivity is actually increased. Um, and that's what's shown here again. Uh, so it might actually be that the fluids, they stop vertically, but then at the same time, if there's a, a semi-permeable layer close to the beef, uh, the fluids might actually start spreading horizontally, and that's shown here. So those are two effects that have to be taken into account, and uh, there the, the, the development team has to consider whether they want big fracks, uh, they want vertical fracks, or they want more lateral fracks and based on that, develop their strategy. Um, this I'll skip, it's just a slide about the importance of uh, the, the vertical uh, resolution in your model. Now, just to summarize, so we have the Vaca Marta formation, uh, which is a shield, and typically people think, okay, when you're fracking a shield, it doesn't really matter where you frack, you just have to make a lot of fracks. But the Vaca Marta formation in Argentina is not a typical shield, because there are a lot of natural heterogeneities in there, and they're really important to take into account in your models. Um, and here is just a schematic or a conceptual model of these uh, different heterogeneities. So here we have a, a sketch of a 3D rock. Uh, we have a cross section here and we have a horizontal well going through it. And then we have the different relevant features. So we have the natural fractures here. We have the, uh, the calcite beef layers and we have the ash beds, so the shield layers. And what may then happen if we start to frack is that some of the fracks they may uh, so we start fracking from this well. And we may have some fracks that go through the ash beds, but then stop at the beef, or may stop at the beef and grow at another place onward. And what is also likely to happen is that these hydraulic fractures start to link up with the natural fractures, and that the overall permeability increases, because we don't only have the induced fractures, but we also have natural fractures contributing to fluid flow. So that's what's shown here. So there are sources of heterogeneity here um, that can actually limit the effectiveness of the hydraulic fracturing. But on the other hand, if we study them and if we model them properly, then we can actually make use of them to increase the permeability of the fracking. So the conclusions here of this study in Argentina is that the stimulated rock volume is very heterogeneous. There are features, for example, the natural fracture corridors, the natural fractures themselves, the calcite layers that create heterogeneities that on the one hand may limit fracture growth, but if we properly look at where they are and include them in the models, we can actually use them to optimize fracking as well. So the highest well connectivity, the recommendation is to make these wells perpendicular to the fracture corridors to try and connect the different fracture corridors. And thankfully, on the seismic, uh, it seems that it is possible to identify at least the large corridors and to map them and then to focus the wells uh, on, on drilling wells perpendicular to those fracture corridors. Now, from a vertical point of view, these calcite B features, they can decrease the fracture height, but at the same time, that may result in longer fractures horizontally. So it's really a question of do we want long horizontal fractures versus large vertical fractures? on how to optimize those wells there. Now, unfortunately, the wells are still being drilled here. So these recommendations were taken into account, but we don't know yet uh, where these predictions are uh, uh, really accurate. But so far, it seems uh, that's true. Now, I just want to address one or two more slides. And uh, I'll actually skip to the last slide. Is uh, So I've shown a range of models but it's still difficult to calibrate them. So here we were using micro seismic data to calibrate the models, um, but we ideally want to use production data to calibrate the models. And what is nice about that, um, these hydraulic fracturing operations is that with time, there will be a lot of, fracture, uh, of, of wells that are producing and generating um, permeability data and well test data. And this well test data is very important to try and constrain our fracture models. And here is one example of how to do that. So well tests, uh, so here we have a typical well test profile. We have the pressure derivative on the vertical axis, the time on the horizontal axis. And then uh, we can actually identify the impact of fracture flow from these curves. But the problem is that this curve uh, can represent all kinds of heterogeneities. So in other words, these curves are not unique and there may be very many different configurations of the fracture network that create such a curve. 
So what we're doing now is to create a lot of different fracture networks or to actually create fracture, or to take fractures from outcrop models and then to create synthetic well tests. So we have a flow model. So this is a, a, a grid here that you see, you see the fractures in red, and then we can put the wells in different locations, either in the fractures or close to the fractures. And now we can start to see what these well test profiles look like and try to define uh, relations between a given well test profile and a given fracture network arrangement. And this way we can use production data, particularly well test data, to also better understand what our fracture networks look like in the rock. So the key takeaway message is that fractured reservoirs are notoriously complex. Um, fractured reservoirs, because they cannot be properly seen, you cannot see the fractures on seismic. Well data only gives you a very small view of the fractures. You need to have other sources of data to constrain your models. And outcrop data is very much valuable, uh, but you have to be very careful uh, because outcrops are never perfect analogs to your subsurface reservoir. So you need to make sure that you create many different model realizations and that you properly calibrate them with as much data as you have available. And that doesn't just have to be production data. That can also be, for example, micro seismic data, pressure interference data, uh, or other geomechanical data. So you need many detailed models and then understand the conceptual learnings that you can get from these models and apply those learnings to your reservoir flow model. And hopefully that will uh, yield some better results. So with that, I hope it was all uh, uh, possible to follow everything. Uh, again, my sincere apologies for the delay, uh, but I still hope that it was an understandable and uh, useful lecture. So if there are any questions, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, and if not through here, you can always send me uh, an email if you have any other questions. All right, so if there are no questions, um, I guess I would like to thank you for your attention. Again, I hope it was all working properly and again, apologies for the delay. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email and uh, happy to discuss further. And thank you very much and I wish you all a nice evening and a good weekend.